up here on Sunday nights, but mainly we want to get, go out there, right, and see people that haven't, haven't, uh, haven't heard about Jesus and share the gospel with them, get in huddles, start, start something going. Right, Jules? Okay, so we're in, is this okay if I walk around here? We're in the book of Luke chapter 19, and it's, a, it, it's really a story about risk, about taking risk, and whether God wants us to take risks or not. And it kind of reminds me of this guy that was in his early 30s, and he was going around, and people started following him. Wherever he went, people would start following him. And it got to be, be crowds of people that were following him, and, and they would show up every day and every night, and they would, they would want to see him, they'd want to hear him, they'd want to hear what he was doing. And uh, one time, in the middle of, the, uh, of all of these crowds of people that were following him and trying to find out what he was about and wanted to, wanted to hear more about him, uh, he stopped in the middle of his concert and he looked out at the crowd of 4,500 people and he looked past them to the trees and the foothills there, right? He could see over, it was, it was the Greek theater in L.A. And he could see over them and he saw all the trees and then he saw that the trees were filled with people. So people, instead of paying to get into the concert since it was full, they climbed up in the trees. And then he was looking out at them and he was, he, he was talking to the people that were there and then he says, but tree people, tree people, this is for you too. Do you know who it was? Neil Diamond, 1972. He noticed the tree people out there, and he said, this is for you too. But this really wasn't the first time that this tree people thing had happened, because we find out about maybe the first tree person in, the book, in Luke chapter 19, and it tells the story of this guy. And here's the way the story goes. Right there. In Luke uh, chapter 19, it says, And Jesus entered and passed through Jericho. Now, Jericho was a city that, was, that Jesus was getting to before he went to Jerusalem. It was near the end of his ministry. He was about to be crucified. And it was, it was Passover was coming, and Jesus was headed toward, Jerus uh, toward Jerusalem. He was going through Jericho. And Jericho is like a, a very wealthy city. There was a lot of trade that went on there. And so he was passing through, and it says, Now behold, there was a man named Nicodemus, I mean Zacchaeus. What am I talking? I can't read today. Okay. A man named Zacchaeus, who was a chief of the tax collectors, and he was rich. Okay. Do you think this guy, uh, Zacchaeus, was a popular guy? Why not? Who wants to see a tax collector? But not only that, he was not just a tax collector, who they didn't like anyway, because tax collectors uh, took your money, and, for, and then they took more money for themselves. They took the money, they were, he was working for the Roman government, right? And that was the guys that, that had put down Israel to begin with. He was taking their money, and then he was taking more money for himself. And this wasn't just a tax collector. This is the only time it tells about a guy like this who was the chief tax collector. So he had other tax collectors working for him. Not only was he getting money from people, he was getting money from his tax collectors who were getting money. So this guy was really rich. He was really rich. Yeah, it was, it, it was a setup all the way. And this is how he got rich. And so here he was. And we already know what, what uh, Jesus thinks of uh, rich people a lot of times, because he said a little bit earlier in the book, he said, it's harder for a rich man to get to heaven than for a camel to get through the eye of a needle. Is that tough to do? I wouldn't want to be the camel that had to do that. He also talked about a rich man that came to the end of his life and he had all these possessions and then he died. And he, he did, what could he do? He, he spent all this time getting things. And then Jesus talked about the rich young ruler who wanted to know what he had to do to get to have eternal life. And Jesus, uh, Jesus told him and he turned around sad he wouldn't do it. So rich people were not... We're not high on Jesus' list of people that were going to make it. But here was this guy. He was a rich person. And it said, and he sought to see who Jesus was. He had everything he could want, but he, he still didn't have what he needed. And he said, maybe this Jesus guy. I want to find out who he is. And so it says, but he could not because of the crowd, for he was short in stature. There was a mob of people that were seeing Jesus. As Jesus was going through the town, the crowd was all around him, was surrounding him. And if you've ever been in that city, do we have anybody that's had problems because it feels like they're a short person here? A short person? 
A few of you, yeah? You sure? Okay, you short people can identify with this. Uh, when I was three, I was short, but since then I've been okay, right? But this guy, well, he, couldn't, he couldn't make it to Jesus. He didn't know what to do. And even though every, everybody hated this guy, really, and here he was out here wanting to see Jesus, and, and even though everybody hated him, it, it didn't, he still wanted to see Jesus. And so it says, so he ran ahead. He ran ahead. How many any of you guys here ran today? Anybody run today? Did you? Okay. You know, uh, do you ever like just go out on the street and just start running? No, treadmill. treadmill that, no, that doesn't count. I'm just talking about like you just, <laughs> just, just, you're just walking along and all of a sudden you just take off, start running. You do that? No. Not generally? No. You do it? Okay. Mark. From time to time. Okay. Mark, uh, you're an exception because most people when they get to be adults, right, they don't run anymore, right? We walk because we're sophisticated, right? We're, oh. we're, we're grown up, right? And especially back in the day, they, they didn't, if you were an, a, a man, you didn't run. You walked, okay? And, and, but not only that, that and what, what does that seem like? What, what kind of behavior is that? You just take off running? Yes. Any kind of age, a, age range? Childish. Yeah, see, come on. Okay. And so it said he ran ahead because he was thinking, I know the perfect spot where he's coming. I'm going to get to that spot. That way I'll, I'll be able to see. And it says, and he climbed up into a sycamore tree to see him. Anybody climbed a tree lately? Anybody? Okay. No? What kind of behavior is that? Childish. Kids do that. We adults don't go running places. We don't climb up on trees. Okay. But this, this guy... Rich had everything he could want. He said, I don't care. I, I don't care if I have to act like a child, because if that's what it takes to see Jesus. And it's a funny thing, because the chapter before in 18, Jesus says, unless you become like a little child, you won't see the kingdom of God. And so maybe this guy was onto something here. He got up in this tree, and he was waiting for Jesus because he wanted to see Jesus. For Jesus was going to pass by, it says. And so when Jesus came to the place, so sure enough, Jesus came to the place, and guess what Jesus did? You don't even have to guess. It's in the verse. What did he do? He looked up. Why did he look up? Yeah. He knew where Zacchaeus wanted, was. It wasn't that Zacchaeus wanted to see him. That, that was true. <clears throat> but even more so, he wanted to see Zacchaeus. Right? He knew right where it was. He went, he, it wasn't an accident. He went to the tree. He stops right there. Crowd, thought, noise everywhere. He looks up, right? Because he knew Zacchaeus was there. And it says, and Jesus came to the place. He looked up and he saw him and he said, Zacchaeus. What else do we find out about Jesus here? He knew his name. Okay, here's what I want you to start to understand. Zacchaeus was desperate because life was going nowhere. He had everything he could want, but life was going no nowhere, and everything he did seemed like it was a dead end. You ever been there? Everything he, he did seemed like a dead end, and so he wanted to see Jesus, but Jesus wanted to see him more. Jesus knew right where he was, and he called his name, and here's what he said. He saw him, and he said, Zacchaeus, make haste. Come down. For I must stay at your house today. He said, hurry up and get down here. For I must go to your house today. Jesus was on a mission to go and be the savior of the world, right? But for some reason, he takes time to stop in the middle of a town he's not even going to. Look up, tell Zacchaeus to come down because I'm going to your house today. And he's trying to, trying to let Zacchaeus know that, Zac that he was important to him. So important that he knew where he was, that he knew his name, and he wanted to see him now. And sometimes in life we can get mixed up about what's important, right? And we can do all kinds of things that are running around and we forget about the fact that to us, to, to Jesus, we're important. He knows our name. Can you believe that? He actually knows our name. We forget that sometimes, that he knows our name. And it, and it said in the, in the chapter before, you've got to become, you've got to come like a little child to Jesus, right? Which means I'm going to, I'm going to, it's something new. I'm going to take steps of faith. I'm going to take a risk to get to Jesus. And he says, I'm going to your house today. Now, has anybody showed up at your house and just showed up and uh, said, I'm going to your house? Anybody? Yeah, what do you do when they just show up and say, I'm going to your house? Okay. 
Are you happy about it usually? <laughs> okay. All right. It's not like, I mean, it happens, some of you hospitality people. Uh, but most of us, when somebody shows up, we don't, we, oh, yeah, how you doing? See you later. Come back to, you know, okay. It's not like you show up. But in that day, right? In that day, if you, if somebody important said they were coming to your house, that meant, what did that mean to, that everybody thought of you? You're important because that person that's important says, I'm going to your house. Here was Zacchaeus. As far as everybody was concerned, he was dirt. He was nothing, right? And, and, and nobody wanted anything to do with him. And besides that, little guy, he's a little guy, you know, have you ever heard that? But what did Jesus do? He made him a big man, right? He made him big. He said, no, no, it doesn't matter what other people think about you. You're big. You're big enough for me to go to your house. So he made haste. Again, they start moving. And, came, and he came down and received him joyfully. But when they saw it, who's the they? Everybody, the whole crowd. When they saw, what? You're giving this guy good treatment? This guy is no good. He'll never be any good. He came from a no good family and now he's a no good person and you're giving him good treatment? They started murmuring. It literally means they ever all started mumbling to themselves, unhappy with him. I'm going to give you five seconds. Mumble. Let's hear you mumble. Go. Stop. Okay. Now, if I thought you were doing that about my sermon, I'd be out of here, right? Okay. Okay. They were, they, they were, they, they, they were not happy that he was doing this at all. It said, uh, but when they saw it, they all complained, saying, he has gone to be the guest of a man who is a sinner. See, in their minds, somebody uh, doesn't deserve to be with Jesus, doesn't be, deserve to be respected by Jesus if they're a sinner. But kind of we all have this thing in our minds of who's a sinner and who's not a sinner. A sinner is somebody that does something just a little bit worse than me, right? They're the sinner. But what does God say? Everybody is a sinner. And I'm, I'm saying this because we, 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 we know it probably, but we forget it or maybe we never really learned it. That in God's eyes, we're forgiven. In God's eyes, we're one of his family. In God's eyes, we're part of, uh, part of a group of people that are, are going to heaven to spend eternity with him, that have the Holy Spirit inside us. And sometimes we get, forget that because we have had voices growing up that say stuff like, you're never going to amount to anything. Or you, you, you're just always making mistakes. Or you're never going to do anything right. And we hear voices like that, and, and we start to, even as Christians, we've been a Christian for a long time, we start listening to those things, especially when other Christians say it to us. Or when uh, things are still going wrong and they're going from, uh, from bad to worse. We, we start forgetting who we are. But, but Zacchaeus took a risk. And he, he went all out. It says, then Zacchaeus, in verse 8, stood and said to the Lord, Look, Lord, I, have, I give half of my goods to the poor. Imagine you're a rich man like Zacchaeus. If you took half of your stuff and gave it to the poor, would that put a dent in your riches? Well, in one way to think about it, yeah, everything you have, you just now cut in half, right? Okay, so you might have been rich, but now you're only half rich, half as rich, right? And so that, that took a dent right there, but then it says, um, he said, and if I've taken anything from anyone by false accusation, this guy is a tax collector. He tries to get money for business. He's overseeing also people that try to get more money. Do you think he possibly took anything from anybody under false accusation? What do you think? You think? I think it's pretty likely. As a matter of fact, he probably wouldn't have the job if he didn't. He was hired for his ruthlessness, right? His ability to get money. And so he'd probably taken advantage of a lot of people. And what did he say? He was going to give them four times what he'd ripped them off? If he was going around giving all the people that he ripped off four times what he'd ripped them off, how much money do you think he'd have left? He might be in the hole by the time. He might have to sell his house. It says here, I restore them fourfold. And Jesus said to him, first of all, Jesus said, I'm going to your house today. And now he says, today salvation has come to this house. Today salvation has come to this house. Why do you think salvation came to that house? 
Do you think it was because he gave half of his stuff to the poor? How about because he gave four times the amount that he ripped people that, did, that didn't bring the salvation to him? Okay. Then what was it that brought salvation? He believed in Jesus. He put his trust in Jesus. As a matter of fact, he goes on to say right here at the end of this, because he also is a son of Abraham. You know what Abraham did that was the big thing that made God, got God's attention? He had faith. He stepped out in faith. What? He, true. That's, that's another step of faith. His first step of faith was to obey and go. When God said, get up and go, he, he went. And now he says, and now he says, Zacchaeus, it is nothing you've done except believing in me, taking a risk to put your trust in me, putting all you have in my hands, trusting in me. That's what gave you salvation. That's what gives us salvation. That's, what, that's who makes us. Jesus makes us a part of his family. And was it, what's the name there, friend? Zacchaeus. Okay. Zacchaeus, Zacchaeus it, it, it responded by doing that, by saying, okay, if Jesus, if I, if Jesus is accepting me, if Jesus is forgiving me, then, then I, what can I do for him? What can I do to show how much I love him? And he started giving stuff away. It says here this, and Jesus said to him, salvation has come to this house because he also was the son of Abraham. For the Son of Man, and here's the key verse in the whole book of Luke right here. It says, for the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. The Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which is lost. He said, the whole reason I've come here is because people are lost and we were one of them, right? And Jesus found us and he says, now the whole reason I've come here is to find other people, to seek and to save the lost. And it's only through Jesus, isn't it? It's only through Jesus. I was flying back from Seattle after driving up there 14 hours Friday. I drove up to Seattle, right? And then Saturday I flew back. And when I was flying back, I was sitting next to this lady, I was and she was talking to me about how uh, that she could help. She, 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 it was a social worker. And she said there's this 12-step program. And it's for helping people uh, that are, are uh, unhealthy or they're overweight and, and and I said, oh, what, what, well, what do you need to do? And she said, well, you need to, you need to appeal for you, you, you. I forget what it is. Somebody, you, some of you guys might know, but it's something about higher power. Well, is there any rest to the sentence or just higher power? Trust in your high, higher power? Okay. Yeah, so she said, you need to trust in your higher power. And I said, oh, okay. So, uh, so I have some people that I think might need to hear this. So, I, so I, I'll tell them to trust in Jesus, right? And she said, no, 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 no. And I said, no. And he said, no, trust in your higher power. It doesn't matter what the higher power is, right? Just trust in the higher power. And I said, uh, the doorknob. It could, be, it could be anything, yeah. And, uh, and so that's where we had, uh, that's kind of was the end of the conversation there on that, that one because she wasn't going for Jesus, right? But the truth is, when you trust in Jesus, you're born again. And some of us are walking around, we don't realize it. We're, we're, we're coming up like a, like a newborn. We're learning a whole new thing about our, our new father and our new family and who we are in Christ. And that's what Zacchaeus was learning as he, as he stepped out in faith, as he took a risk. And, and I still have a couple more minutes, so I'm going to tell you, because what Jesus did was he told a story after this. Because it says he spoke another parable in verse uh, 11. He's, in other words, he was, tell, he was talking to everybody and then he spoke another parable. He said, I want, to, I want to tell you something further about this. Because he was near Jerusalem and because they thought that the kingdom of God would appear immediately. So he was coming close to Jerusalem. He was heading to Jerusalem. It was, it was going to be his last, last Passover there. And what do you think people were thinking when he was coming to Jerusalem? He was going to take over. He was going to be the king. And so they thought, he's coming to Jerusalem. He's going to take over the capital, capital and, the, the, and the God's people are going, going to rule forever. This is it. And he says, oh, wait a minute. Just let me tell you a little story to help you understand that it's not exactly like that. And so he said, there was a certain nobleman that went into a far country to receive for himself a kingdom and to return. If you were going to guess, who would you think that certain nobleman might be? 
Jesus, somebody that's going away, right? And he's coming back and he's gonna receive a kingdom and then come back, right? Jesus even said that. He said, I go away, but I'm gonna come again. And so he says, but the citizens hated him and sent a delegation after him saying, we will not have, have this man to rule over us. And so most of the people didn't want, uh, didn't want uh, this guy to be king. Most people don't want Jesus to be king. But it said he called in 10 of his servants and delivered them 10 Midas, Minas, and said to them, do business till I come. And so he gave them 10, he gave 10 people, each of them, uh, a Minas, M-I-N-A-S, how do you say that? Not minus, minus. Anyway, in the King James, it says a pound, right? Minus? Okay. Well, anyway, it was worth three months' salary. And so this, this guy was generous. He gave them something worth three months' salary. He said, I want you to do business. I want you to make some money for me while I'm gone. I want you to do something. If you have three months' salary and, so, and your boss gives it to you, what do you need to do? Make it more. You have to take a risk somehow, right? Okay. And so it said when he, when he came back, the first thing, uh, when he came back, he asked the first saying, uh, Master, yeah, this is verse 16, your minus has earned, your minus, we'll say your pound, has earned 10 pounds. How many people here would like to gain 10 pounds? No. <laughs> okay, well, that's not what it means. Okay. You, you've got 10 times as much as I gave you. And he said to him, well done, good servant, because you've been faithful with a little, I give you authority over 10 cities. Okay, so we learn something about Jesus here, and that is he gives, when, when he left, he gave us some things. He gave us the Holy Spirit. He gave us gifts. He gave us money. He gave us talents. And he said, I want you to do something with them. And that something requires a risk. And so he said, good job. Uh, and then the next guy, he gave him, he, gave, he said, well, I've earned five. And he, said, he didn't say, good job, my, well, I'm a good and faithful servant, but he didn't say, okay, I'm going to give you five cities. And, the la and then here comes the last guy. Then there came another one saying, master, here's your, your, your minna. Here's your pound, which I have kept uh, away, head away in a handkerchief. For I feared you because you're an austere man. You collect what you do not deposit and reap what you do not sow. Okay, so here's what I want you to notice. We're, we're wrapping it up here. This first guy, when he got this money, this three months salary, and he had some time to do something with it, he took some risks to try to make money, to try to, to make more of what, of what uh, Jesus had given to him. What does, that, what does that mean about the way he felt about Jesus? What do you think? What? He loved him a lot. Yeah, absolutely. Anything else? He respected him. Yeah. Anything else? I think that's all true. He trusted him. Yeah. He, you know, uh, he, he, he believed that no matter what he did, if he took a risk, God was going to do something with it. And even if he failed, he didn't think God was out there to squash him, right? He trusted Jesus. He trusted what he would do. He trusted that he would give him grace. He experienced grace. He said, that, that's who Jesus is to me. He's someone who gives grace. And so what can I do except for do the best I can with what he's given me because he's going to help me. Now, the second guy got five, and he didn't say bad job for him. So he probably trusted Jesus somewhat, maybe not as much as the first guy. But this last guy said, no, I know what you're like. You're strict. You, you, you sow where you, you reap where you don't sow. Uh, and so I just took it, okay? What do you think this guy thought about, what do you think this kind of thought about Jesus? Afraid. He was afraid, yeah. He, he, he felt like he couldn't be trusted and maybe like he wasn't out for his best interest. And Jesus is trying to say, look, you've got to understand the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. My whole purpose here was to reach out and to bring you into my family. I want to give you, I want you to understand something new about me. I'm not like your parents, even though they might have some good, good qualities. Being part of God's family is different. It's about grace. It's about starting over. It's about growing up in a family where you're accepted and where you're gifted and when you're, where you're welcomed and where you're secure and where you have a place forever. That's what it's about. And so uh, Jesus said, 
You knew that I was an austere man, collecting what I didn't deposit and reaping what I didn't sow. Why then did you put the money, why not put the money in the bank that it may be uh, collected with interest? And he said to the one who stood there, take his money away from him and give it to the one who had 10. But they said, master, he already has 10. What do you think Jesus was saying by that? First of all, I don't think he was, I think when he said, you, you say I'm this way, I don't think he was that way, is he? He's just saying, this, if this is what you think I am, okay, I'm going to act this way because you didn't do anything, you didn't accept this grace, and so I want to give, I want to give my gifts to someone that's going to do something with it. And it finishes off this way. It says, but bring those enemies of mine who do not want to me to reign over them and slay them before me. So here's, here's the two things that are going on. The one thing is there's all kinds of people in the world that never want to accept Jesus. They're not, you can knock on their door, right? And they're, they're going to say no every time, right? We, we heard some stories of a few people that said yes tonight, right? And those are the highlights we can tell them, but there's a lot of people that says no. And those people are choosing to reject Jesus. But then there's us. We've accepted Jesus, but sometimes we don't realize what we have here. We don't realize that Jesus is the king. Jesus is a good king. Jesus is a king that cares about us. He wants to provide for all of, uh, all of his family forever. That's our king. And it, it reminds me uh, just this whole idea about if, if we can really, tr if you really know who Jesus is, you can trust him, right? You can trust him to step out and take risks all over the place because you, you know he's got you. You know, he's got you. It reminds me of when I was in seventh grade and I was playing baseball and, uh, and I never got a hit all season. That shows how good I was at baseball, right? Well, this was, this was the last game of the season. And as a matter of fact, there were two outs and I was up, right? And, and, and the thing that had happened was for some, some reason, it got to be full count. I really don't know how that, how that came, but you know, two, three balls and two strikes. Right? I'm standing there, and I decided I am not going to go out without swinging, right? Okay? You know, this is my last chance. My parents are in the stand, right? And everybody's watching. My friends are there. And so I'm up. The pitcher pitches the ball. It comes flying across the plate. Thud, it hits the catcher's mid. The umpire calls, ball. He starts to say ball, and you know what I did? I swung as hard as I could. <laughs> The umpire, he'd already called ball, but he stops for a second. I don't even know if this is legal, what he did. But he stops and he looks at me. He looks at my parents in the stand and he says, strike three, you're out of there. Strike three. Strike three, I don't know, is that legal? I don't know, but he, he said, the, the thing was I, I waited until it was already passed and then I swung at the ball, okay? And here's the thing, in life, Jesus is talking about today. He said, what can you do today? You're my child today. And you need to understand that today is the only day you have, right? And so, like me, okay, the only chances you get are the ones you take. The only chances you have to serve Christ, to, to, to do his business, to realize who he is and to behave in that manner is to serve him now, to take the chance, to take the risk, to take, and it's really not a risk at all, right? Because you can't lose. You're playing with his money, right? So you can't lose. He, he's the one that's in charge. If he doesn't bless it, whose problem is that, right? So the only chances in life you have are the ones you take. And he said, I am that king. I am that king that you can trust. Do you think you might be able to stand and sing a couple songs of worship to that king? What do you think?